Hello, Thermo One class. Um, as you'll be reading in an email shortly, uh, we're not going to meet in class uh, this coming week. And so um, this is the Tuesday lecture. I'm going to go ahead and record. Uh, we're finished the lecture material, so we will just be working uh, through the uh, homework problems and example problems. So um, I will. Uh, get this uh, link out to you uh, shortly. Uh, this is actually Sunday evening, so you'll have plenty of time to review this. And then for the Thursday class, we will start into chapter 10, so uh, which is our last chapter to cover. Okay, so this is the first of the rank and cycle homework problems assigned, uh, problem 8-2. So let's take a look at this. Uh, steam is the working fluid in an ideal Rankine cycle, one, two, three, four, one. And <clears throat> so this is our TS diagram. So hopefully by now you can start to envision these processes. Uh, ideal means we're isentropic. So one to two is the turbine. Two to three is the condenser. Uh, three to four is the pump. And four to one is the boiler or the generation of the steam, and we're stopping with saturated steam in uh, this Rankine cycle, okay? Um, and we're gonna compare that to a Carnot cycle, which operates one, two, uh, three prime, four prime, one. So the Carnot cycle is one to two, the same turbine. Condenser is, uh, goes from two to three. So you can see we don't quite condense all of the vapor. We still have a two phase working fluid at three. And then we go straight up uh, in the pump from three prime to four prime, which gets us to a saturated liquid. And then the boiler vaporizes just across the saturation dome. So that's uh, in terms of an ideal, um, uh, Carnot cycle, that's what it would look like uh, for a Rankine cycle on a TS diagram. And then we have some of the, the state points are given, which is real nice in this problem. Okay, um, both cycles incorporate the steady flow devices shown in the figure, and we just talked through those. The uh, uh, turbine, um, condenser, pump, and boiler. For each cycle, determine A, the net power developed per unit mass of steam flowing in kilojoules per kilogram, and two, the thermal efficiency, and then compare the results and comment. Okay. Uh, so let's see, we have ideal Rankine and then the Carnot cycle operating between the pressures of uh, 1.5 bar on the low side down here and 60 bar on the high side. And here's all of our state points, which again, they've given us the enthalpy, the quality, and the specific volume uh, down here at three. Okay. And so we can look at the uh, diagrams. Here's the uh, uh, the ideal Rankine cycle, there's our boiler. So we're uh, 60 bar uh, saturated vapor into the turbine. Uh, we come out, <clears throat> isentropic turbine, we come out at 1.5 bar. We go into the condenser and then this is our lake water coming in to take the heat away to condense the working fluid. And then we have our pump nice isentropic pump, which gets us from our low side pressure of 1.5 bar up to 60. Um, and then on the Carnot cycle, we see we have the same condition coming out of the boiler. We have the same turbine. Uh, we have a similar condenser, even though state three prime is not the same, it's at the same pressure. And then we have a pump that gets us to uh, four prime, um, and then back up to the boiler. So P4 prime is equal to oh, P1, which is 60. And at X4, we know that we're saturated liquid on um, 
at uh, four prime. Yeah, so when we come out of the pump, we pump up to saturated liquid. We have a quality here at three prime, which is we're about 27% vapor. And at two, where we come out of the turbine, we're almost 77% vapor. So there's a lot of moisture coming out of the turbine. Okay, uh, engineering model. Uh, each component, both cycles analyzed as a control volume at steady state. And there, we've, we've seen the dashed in lines up here for the control volumes. Uh, for both cycles, all processes, uh, the working fluid are internally reversible. This is all ideal. The turbine and pump operate adiabatically for both cycles. We're going to not consider kinetic potential energy effects. Saturated vapor enters the turbine for both cycles. Uh, condensate exits the condenser as saturated liquid in the ideal Rankine cycle. And water exits the pump at saturated liquid for the Carnot cycle. Okay, so we, we know that um, per unit mass flowing that the uh, power out of the cycle per unit mass is equal to the turbine work, rate of doing uh, the turbine producing work per unit mass minus the rate at which uh, the pump is consuming work per unit mass. So mass and energy rate balances for control volumes around the turbine for both cycles give. So uh, for the turbine work, it's just H1 minus H2 and M dot is the mass flow rate of steam coming out of the boiler, pretty basic stuff. Uh, so for the uh, Rankine cycle, uh, let's see, that's, that's the turbine for both, that's common. And then for the Rankine cycle, for the pump work, we have H4 minus H3. I don't get written as a positive number. Uh, it's just the enthalpy difference across the pump. It just, we have two different states. Um, we go look at the diagram for the Rankine cycle, the four is here, and for the Carnot cycle, the four prime is up here. And so the Carnot cycle, uh, the work, uh, the rate of the pump using work per, uh, per divided by the mass flow rate is H4 prime minus H3 prime. Uh, so we can solve for the net power developed per unit mass of steam flowing for each cycle. So we simply, uh, for the Rankine cycle, it's the turbine work minus the pump work because they all have the full mass flow through them. And plugging in the um, enthalpies that in this case, you didn't have to find them because they're given in the table right here. So we're just gonna plug those in. And uh, when you do and do the arithmetic, you get, uh, 597.5 kilojoules per kilogram for the Rankine cycle. And when we do it for the Carnot cycle, we actually get a lower number. We get 470.1. And remember the thermal efficiency of the cycle is the net work per unit mass divided by the heat input per unit mass. And so for the Rankine cycle, we got H1 minus H4, which is 2311 kilojoules per kilogram. And for the Carnot cycle, we've got uh, 1570.9, okay, because we're, um, it's H1 minus H4 prime, and H4 prime is a much larger number. And so that reduces the amount of heat input. So the thermal efficiency of the Rankine cycle comes out to be 25.85%, but for the Carnot cycle, it's 29.93%, which shouldn't surprise us because the Carnot cycle has the highest theoretical efficiency of any cycle. However, there's some notes here, and I think I can probably just tell you the notes, but cool. So, you know, why don't we just employ the Carnot cycle you know, as the basis for our power plants. And it's because the pump's only gonna last a short period of time because 
uh, we're putting a bunch of vapor, which is the definition of cavitation into the pump. So three to four works out well theoretically, but it's going to destroy the pump. Uh, and, uh, let's see what his other note is. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ah, well, okay. So, uh, note one, this is, this is pretty good. Uh, forgot about this one. For an ideal cycle, the enclosed area on the TS diagram represents the net power developed per unit mass flowing. By inspection, and we'll go up and look at it, the Rankine cycle enclosed area, one, two, three, four, is greater than the Carnot cycle area, uh, one, two, three prime, four prime, one, so, you know, the Rankine cycle is, the network is the area enclosed. So one, two, three, four, four prime one, but for the Carnot cycle, it's one, two, three prime, four prime one. So Rankine cycle has more area, but we're, what's gonna happen is we're rejecting more heat in the condenser. So, and the boiler requires less energy input, so Carnot winds up winning. Um, although the turbine produces the same power per unit mass of steam flowing in both cycles, the Carnot cycle pump requires much more uh, input per unit mass of steam flowing, for it is a liquid vapor mixture, than the pump in the Rankine cycle. It's liquid to achieve. And note two, uh, for an ideal cycle, the thermal efficiency tends to increase with the average temperature at which energy is added by uh, heat transfer increases. And we've said that before by inspection. Carnot cycle has a higher average uh, temperature at which energy is added by heat addition than uh, the Rankine cycle. Although it produces more power per unit mass of steam flow in the Rankine cycle requires a greater rate of heat transfer into the cycle since energy since uh, energy input is required to raise the temperature of the liquid exiting the pump to the saturation temperature. So anyway, Carnot winds up to be more efficient um, because uh, Rankine has to heat from four and see that's at a lower temperature, so that lowers the average temperature of the heat addition. So anyway, it shouldn't be surprising that Carnot winds up with a higher efficiency. Okay, <clears throat> let's go on to problem uh, eight, nine, uh, which was the second assigned problem. So uh, the figure we see below, I think you can get all that on the screen, uh, provides steady state operating data for a solar power plant that operates on a Rankine cycle with refrigerant 134A as the working fluid. And so um, you would change working fluids because this refrigerant boils at much lower temperatures. If you were trying to operate this with water, it just wouldn't work very well because we can't, we have a hard time generating high enough temperatures uh, to generate significant pressures in, uh, the, in making the steam uh, with water as the working fluid uh, to make the cycle uh, function and get much power output. So uh, we changed the working fluid here, which uh, helps the performance significantly. Uh, based on the temperatures and pressures that we can generate. That's kind of what's going on in the background. So, you, you know, this is um, kind of like an organic Rankine cycle. It's just a typical organic Rankine cycle it uses waste heat from an industrial facility instead of um, thermal energy from the sun. Okay, so the pump and turbine operate adiabatically. Um, the rate of energy input to the collectors from solar radiation is 0.3 kW per meters squared of collector surface area, with 60% of the solar input to the collectors absorbed by the refrigerant as it passes through the collectors. So whatever you know, the amount of sunshine that 
we get on the collectors, we get 60% of that energy into the working fluid. Okay, uh, determine the solar collector surface area in meter squared per kW of power developed by the plant. Discuss possible operational improvements that could reduce the required collector surface area because those things are expensive and you got to have a fair amount of them to generate much power. So we see here's our solar collector. It's basically the boiler producing um, steam, either saturated or superheat, or no, not steam, but refrigerant 134A goes through the turbine, expands through the turbine. We reject heat in a condenser and we got a pump. So it's a typical Rankine cycle. Uh, very kind of them to give you the enthalpies and the qualities to let you see. Um, and then so we can draw the uh, TS diagram for this. So we see our pressures, our high pressure is 18 bar and our condenser pressure is seven bar. And so state one is coming out. So X is one, so this is saturated uh, vapor and then when we come out of the turbine we're just we're almost still saturated but there's a little bit of moisture in there and then three uh, is uh, will be saturated liquid and then uh, four coming out of the pump it's probably uh, subcooled liquid or um, compressed liquid however you want to say it Okay, so I think we set all that, find this. Okay, so here's our TS diagram. And notice that uh, these are, this is not an isentropic turbine or a pump, but we avoided having to work through the isentropic uh, pump and turbine equations because it gave us all the enthalpies. So if you have all the enthalpies, then that part of the work is already done. Okay, so uh, and he's show well now. Okay, he's showing this as superheated over here. Well, he's calling. Okay, so may, I guess it is superheated. I took that one to mean that it was saturated vapor, but I guess he's showing it. I mean, we can go back in the table. Well, well, we'd have to go back and find this enthalpy in the tables, but we'll take his word for it. So he is superheating. He's dropping down the isentropic, goes straight down, and the real turbine is a little bit closer because we have some entropy increase. And then the condenser has to work from two over to three, which does look like saturated liquid. And then <clears throat> we go up from three to four. And so it's not an isentropic pump. Uh, and then the solar collector has to take us from four to one. So pretty. Pretty simple. Um, so we know that the total work output of the cycle is the mass flow rate of refrigerant uh, times the specific work out of the turbine, the rate of turbine work per mass flow minus the rate of pump work required per mass flow. And then so the, you know, the M dots are gonna cancel when you multiply through. Uh, let's see, does he give us M dot? Oh, no, I say, no, we're going to, um, oh, yeah, it, it's, uh, we're, we're doing this per kW of work input. So we're going to assume one kW, and then we're going to solve for the mass flow that would give us that uh, amount of work output. So here's the equation, and then he just substituting in the enthalpy differences. Uh, for the turbine work, it's H1 minus H2, one to two, the turbine expansion, and then minus the pump work, which is H4 minus H3. So that's what the pump requires. Uh, and then so we saw for M dot here, assuming one kW, which is a kilojoule per second. And so when you substitute all the enthalpies in that he gave you and do the arithmetic, we get 0 0.06817 uh, kilograms per second. Thus, uh, the rate of heat transfer 
uh, into the refrigerant per kW of power produced by the uh, power produced as refrigerant passes through the solar collector is. So Q dot N, that's the mass flow rate times H1 minus H4 because, you know, we're coming out. This is our boiler, basically. So we come out at H1. We went in at H4. So H1 minus H4 times M dot is the amount uh, that we have to have. Uh, where am I? Okay, yeah, I'm right here. Okay, so that's our mass flow rate. That's our enthalpy difference. So Q dot N, we have, that's what we actually have to put into the refrigerant. We have to put 12.88 kW in in order to generate one kW of power. And so to get this, our solar collectors are only 60% efficient. And so 0.6 times whatever has to hit uh, the, uh, the area of the solar collector, um, then that's what the solar collectors have to see in order to give us this. So we divide by 0.6. And so the solar collectors have to see, have to uh, actually see 21.47 kW worth of energy striking them. And so we see that um, we get 0.3 kW per meters squared. And so then we can take the 21.47 divided by 0.3 and that says 71.57 meters squared is the amount of solar collector area that you would need to generate one kW. Now you could play around, think about Kingston steam plant, which now the design capacity is 1900 megawatts or 1.9 million kW with all the deratings and additional environmental stuff, they're probably someplace around a thousand megawatts, which would be a, a million kW. So figure out how much uh, land mass you're going to have to cover with solar collectors in order to be able to drive a utility scale power plant. <laughs> it's a pretty good size area, I suspect. So discussion, um, to reduce required uh, collector surface area, one could improve the cycle, the solar collector, or both. Improved cycle thermal efficiency can be achieved by reducing irreversibilities. Well, I agree with that if you figure out how to do it. Uh, improved solar collector performance can be achieved by reducing irreversibility straight heat transfer from the collector to allow the refrigerant to absorb more of the incident energy. Well, yeah. And, um, you know, maybe you come up with a better glass or maybe you come up with one that uh, doesn't lose heat or, you know, I don't know. Uh, it's one thing to think about. It's a little harder to accomplish. Maybe you put in a more efficient pump. Probably not, it wouldn't have much of an impact. Maybe you find a turbine that has a higher isentropic efficiency. Lots of possibilities. Okay, let's move on to problem 814. So this is a very fundamental uh, rank and cycle problem. Uh, so, you know, we've got a steam generator, we got some heat uh, going into the working fluid. Uh, the working fluid comes out of the steam generator or boiler at six. Uh, the mass flow rate is 12 kilograms a second. Uh, we have some work coming out of the turbine. Uh, we come out of the turbine at state two. We go into the condenser, reject heat to the environment, and we have uh, saturated liquid coming out of the condenser at three. We go into the pump. Uh, there's, we require some work input to get us to four, and then at state five we go in. Oh, uh, and and. Yeah, so what they've done here is they've incorporated some heat loss. For example, from six to one, uh, they have slightly different states. Uh, from six, 
you see the enthalpy falls at six, it's 35, 45.3, and at one, it's 34, 22.2. So uh, they are incorporating some real world effects in here, uh, and they just give you the enthalpies. So we come out of the pump uh, four at, um, let's see, enthalpy of uh, 199.4. And when we get to the boiler, it's down to 167.57. So, and you can see the uh, pressure from, uh, let's see, from four. Well, we're not doing any pressure losses from uh, uh, six to one. Uh, let's see, what are we doing from four to five? We're doing a little bit of a pressure loss. From four, we say we're 7.5 megapascals. And we're, uh, seven into the end of the boiler and we're six out of the boiler so you know when they they've incorporated some of these real world effects um, but they didn't make you find the enthalpies so I guess you can be happy for that so we want to use these enthalpies and we want to determine the thermal efficiency and the rates of heat transfer Q dot in and Q dot out so Q dot in is in the boiler Q out is in the condenser and the cycle efficiency so this is just pretty much plug and chug. So the uh, net work out of the cycle is uh, the uh, work out of the turbine, which per unit mass is H1 minus H2, one to two across the turbine. And then we have to subtract off the pump work, which is H4 minus H3, and then we have to divide by the heat input in the boiler, which is uh, H6 minus H5. So just plugging in the numbers, we're getting 52.7%, which is a little higher than reality probably. Um, and for the steam generator, the heat in, so we've got 12 kilograms a second, M dot times uh, H6 minus H5, and so this comes up to out to 4.054 times 10 to the fourth uh, kW. And from the condenser, we're going to reject uh, m dot times H2 minus H3, 12 times the enthalpy difference is 1.73 times 10 to the fourth kW. Uh, and so you know these. These, these heat losses and all from here to here just require that we put more uh, heat into the boiler, which hurts the cycle efficiency. All righty, moving along to uh, problem 819. Uh, we see, well, let's look at the diagram here. So we see we've got uh, a reheat cycle here. I don't have any feed water heaters, but we got a reheat cycle. So we come out of the boiler, the main steam, 140 bar, went to the first turbine, uh, drop pressure to 15 bar, go in, we'll add some temperature, add some energy to the working fluid, uh, no pressure drop. So we're ignoring any pressure drops. So we're coming out at 15 bar. We go through the second turbine, we drop to one bar, and then we come out to the condenser, we reject heat, and then we come out, typically saturated liquid, go into the pump, uh, which elevates us back to uh, 140 bar, goes around the cycle. So uh, you can see the TS diagram, uh, first turbine, the, everything's isentropic because we're straight down. We've got uh, vertical lines, so one to two. Here's the first turbine, and then we go back to the boiler. We increase temperature from two to three. Uh, let's see. Yeah, he's, let's see, from two to three. Uh, at two, we're 201.2, uh, .2, and at three, we're uh, 428.9. And then we expand through the second turbine, and it looks like, it looks like we're coming out right about at saturation at four. So, and then we're going to condense over to five, and then we're going to pump from five to six, again, isentropic, and then the boiler is going to take us from six back to one. 
you see the pressures, and so we're nice and ideal and all that stuff. Okay, so let's read it now. So steam is the working fluid in an ideal reheat uh, Rankine cycle shown uh, below. Uh, together with operational data. If the mass flow rate is 1.3 kilograms a second, determine the power developed by the cycle in KW and the cycle thermal efficiency. Okay, so once again, you got the enthalpies here. So this is going to be pretty easy. All right, so let's see. Uh, engineering model, you know, control volume, steady state. We got the dashed in control volumes around each component. Uh, all processes internally reversible, nice and ideal. Uh, adiabatic pumps and turbines, kinetic potential energy is ignored, and condensate exits the condenser as saturated liquid. Okay, so work for the cycle uh, network is uh, what the turbine one produces, the rate of it, plus what turbine two produces, minus the rate at which the pump consumes energy. We see that turbine one is just the mass flow rate times H1 minus H2. It's the enthalpy difference across this turbine. And the second turbine will be what H? Uh, uh, H3 minus H4, I believe. <laughs> yep, M dot H3 minus H4, and the pump is M dot H6 minus H5 coming out here. These are all just written to be positive. Okay. So the network for the cycle is plugging in the enthalpy definitions into this equation is the mass flow rate times the first turbine plus the second turbine minus the pump. Plugging in all the enthalpies that were given. We get the uh, work out of the cycle, and this is for the actual mass flow rate, 1.3 kilograms per second, is 1568.2 uh, kW. And then the efficiency uh, of the cycle is this network divided by the heat input in the boiler. And don't forget, we have two, since it's a reheat cycle, we put in heat here. And we also put heat into the reheat section. So we have to include both of those. So it's the mass flow rate times H1 minus H6 for the main steam, and then H3 minus H2 for the reheat steam. So plugging in those enthalpies, we get uh, 4503.6 kW, and then the thermal efficiency is just the ratio of those. In this case, it comes out 38 point, uh, 36. 34.82%, uh, okay. Okay, next on the assignment list was problem 823. And this is very similar to the last problem. The only difference is that uh, we don't have isentropic uh, turbines or a pump. And so you can see from the TS, well, let's look at the, let's make this a little smaller. There we go. So it's, uh, you know, two turbines, one reheat cycle. Um, and we've changed the, uh, uh, I believe some of the pressures from the last one. And also it, it's, uh, but it's essentially the same problem. The only difference is that this turbine now Come, comes down and uh, bends over as showing an increase in entropy. And then we reheat and we see that same, uh, a similar increase in entropy for the second turbine. And then the pump doesn't go straight up. But you don't really, since you're given the enthalpies, it's really pretty much the same problem. Uh, we do see a, uh, uh, I believe a lower cycle efficiency. But I think I'll just, I'll let you guys study this one. I don't think this one, it's so similar to the last one that I don't think it's worth um, talking through. So I'm going to post this one. And then uh, a little bit later, I will record the solution on um, 
the 37, 41, and 49, which you already have, but I'll talk through those. Uh, and depending on time, I may add uh, another problem or two to that recording. So um, you guys uh, have a great night and uh, I'll be back with you soon.